Now, there was a time, I think, 30 or 40 years ago, perhaps, when being green was quite simple. Um, you were against whaling and cutting down trees and polluting the air and the seas, and you thought that humanity should stop doing these things for its own sake and for the sake of the rest of the world. You thought it was wrong. You campaigned to, to stop it, and sometimes you succeeded. And there were and there are some real successes which are worth feeling joyful about. But as time went by, it of course became clear that all of these struggles happen within the context of something bigger, within the context of the human machine, the growth economy, if you like, our expanding civilization, more people demanding more stuff. Victories won are swallowed up by the accelerating pace of destruction, which was not called destruction, but was called development. And it became clear that Greens were actually firefighting, often successfully, but still firefighting, that the real problem was systemic. At this point, of course, things got a bit complicated. Now these days, being green is actually much harder, but also very much more successful. On the surface, environmentalism has been successful in a way that its founders could only have dreamed of. Except that I wonder whether they would have dreamed of it looking like this. Because you don't have to look very deep to see that this surface popularity, this consumer environmentalism, disguises a hollowing out of the green movement's heart. I think that its fleeting and shallow popularity has left it soulless. Environmentalism has been Tony Blair. <laughs> now, there are two reasons why mainstream environmentalism is dying out a very public death today. First one is simple. It's failing on everything. On all measures, virtually everything is getting worse. Forty years of very public environmentalism has failed to prevent the forests being felled, the oceans being emptied, the climate being changed, the soil being blown away on the wind. We are living through the sixth mass extinction event. Within our lifetime, we could see the end of coral reefs, a massive reduction in the biodiversity of the Earth. The machine that is doing this, the human economy, is speeding up, not slowing down. Because if it doesn't speed up, it falls apart. Individual battles are won by environmentalists every day, but the onrush of the machine makes them seem like drops in the ocean. So in short, it's not working. With the best will in the world, it's not working. The second problem, I think, it's a bit more existential than that. Environmentalism, in many guises, and certainly in its most popular guises, has forgotten what it's for. Here's a quote I came across the other week on the American website Treehugger. And if you will know, quite a well-known green website. And as he explains the urgent need for environmentalists to adopt yet another new strategy of some kind, the writer issues this telling declaration. He says, the success of environmentalism will be judged on whether we manage to halt and even reverse the threats that environmental destruction and resource depletion pose to our way of life. Our way of life. Repeat that to yourself and reflect on it. The purpose of environmentalism is no longer anything as naive as saving the actual environment. Now it's about threats to our way of life. And what do we mean by our way of life? We mean the way of life of middle class people like us in affluent post-industrial societies, used to getting what they want. And the need to appeal to people like us and to sell us environmentalism, promote it to the government, has forced us, as Greens, to gloss over some uncomfortable truths. Environmentalism should start, and used to start, with the asking of a simple question. What is best for the rich web of life on Earth? How do we live in order that this should be maintained? But almost unnoticed, that question has been subtly and gradually replaced by another one. How can we maintain our lifestyles whilst doing as little damage to the environment as possible? These are two very different questions and they give us two very different answers. They lead us into two very different futures. What we call environmentalism today might be more accurately described as human survivalism. A scrabble in an age of contraction to keep our illusions afloat. And this explains the current mainstream green approach, focus on the technology. We can't apparently imagine a world without superhighways and superstores, and we need to be realistic. This is how we find ourselves in a world in which environmentalists have become developers. Shilling for the large-scale <coughs> rolling out across wilderness areas of turbines, wave machines, giant mirrors and all the rest, which will give us the energy we need to avoid having to change anything very much at all. Now, I don't think this is deliberate. This is not what Greens intend. This isn't the message they think they're giving out, but it's the message they're giving out. 
And I don't think it's surprising, actually. Our generation is coming to terms with the fact, firstly, that we are capable of massacring life on Earth in an enormous way. We're committing ecocide and we know it. Secondly, that our, the foundations of our culture and civilization are more fragile than we used to think they were. We can see the likely, likely peaking of our fuel supplies and our water supplies and even of our food. All of this in the context of the global ecocide that we are creating in order to make ourselves happy. And above all, we can see the peaking of our comfort. We see that the bubble could burst and we don't like it. We want to stop it. And we pretend that this desire is altruistic or green, but it's in fact understandably selfish. It's not about the planet, it's about us. We are scared and it's okay to be scared. It seems to me that environmentalism as we've known it is going through a terminal phase. We can't engineer our way out of the limits we are pushing because we don't face an engineering crisis. We face something deeper. Let me just offer two brief thoughts to finish about what environmentalism could become or perhaps what values it should go back to if it wants to, I think, reconnect again. The first is a thought about depth and about connection. The reason that this eco-pragmatist approach has failed is that it asks the wrong questions. The problems we face are not actually at root technological or scientific, they're cultural. They're even existential, they have deep roots. The ecological crisis is at root a human cultural crisis. It's about what our values are, how we relate to the world around us, what we want, how we get it, where we go. In case that sounds a bit airy-fairy, here's the view of a scientist on the same matter. I quote, the human being is part of the whole called by us universe. We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings as something separate from the rest. This is a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. The delusion is a kind of prison. Our task must be to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. We shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if humanity is to survive. That's Albert Einstein. Here's the same thing from a poet. We must uncenter our minds from ourselves. We must unhumanize our views a little and become confident of the rock and ocean that we were made for. That's Robinson Jeffers. Here's a painter. When we speak of nature, it is wrong to forget that we are ourselves a part of nature. We ought to view ourselves with the same curiosity and openness with which we study a tree or the sky or a thought, because we too are linked to the entire universe. That's Matisse. What we have here is the same idea expressed in different words through different disciplines. The idea of connection. The idea that there's no such thing as nature. There's no such thing as an environment external to us. There's only the world of which we're a part. And to understand it, our first task is to see that we're not at its centre. And I think that that's what environmentalists and what all of us actually in this culture have forgotten. And what any new kind of environmentalism needs to start from. My second thought is also about connections, but at a more basic level. Um, I look around me at all the greens I know and I see most of them staring at illuminated screens in cities, writing policy papers about sustainability. I've spent far too much time in my life doing exactly the same kind of thing. We've all spent too long aping the dominant culture and as a result we have become as deracinated as that culture. And this is a terrible bind because it means that the unthinking assumptions of that culture are repeated in today's cosmopolitan environmentalist thinking. I've lost count of the number of times I've heard campaigners from big green NGOs based in London slagging off local people who dare to oppose their grand schemes. From fishermen trying to make a living to local people fighting to stop landscapes being desecrated by renewable power stations on wild land. I've heard far too many Greens talk of their opponents as NIMBYs who are standing in the way of progress. The irony of using the same language which was designed specifically to discredit Green ideas seems lost. And we need to replace this kind of thinking with a vernacular environmentalism which comes first and foremost from an appreciation of ordinary small places. Get out of the house more, turn the phone off, turn the email off, immerse ourselves in the complexities of our local world, which is in essence our whole world. Environmentalism without an environment is just a theory. It becomes easy to co-opt as it has been co-opted by forces of despair posing as forces of hope. Thank you for listening.